Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to tell you about two fundamental theorems in the cohomology of coherent sheaves on projective varieties. Uh, these theorems are due to Serre, who in many ways founded this subject, and I just want to go through them in the nice easy case of curves. Okay, so let's look at our setup here. So here, x is going to be a projective curve over some algebraically closed field k. And the projectivity here is important as opposed to just quasi-projective or affine. Okay, so when we want to compute cohomology in this case for curves, remember we need some open affine cover consisting of two uh, uh, elements. Okay, and the easiest way to do that is to consider what's called an affine map from x to p1. Uh, there exists such a subjective affine map, okay, and given that, that means that you can actually use the standard open affine cover of this P1XY, so if we write P1as A1Z and A1Z inverse, the inverse images of these will give you uh, an open affine cover of X, okay, so X is U0 union U1, where these open affine sets U0 and U1 are just the inverse images of A1Z and A1Z inverse. Okay, so that's what we need to compute cohomology on this projective curve X. And now suppose we have a coherent sheaf here, M. Okay, so this is really about a finiteness sort of situation and say finiteness. And to get finiteness, we firstly need this finiteness consumption, uh, assumption looking at coherent sheaves as opposed to more general quasi-coherent ones. Okay, and the other thing is that projectivity will be important because this is a type of compactness argument which is also a type of generalization of finiteness. Okay, so that's what we need and interestingly we have to introduce uh, this what's called a Serre twist of this coherent sheaf, m twisted by n, and this n here is just any integer. Okay, so let's see what that is. So this is going to be a coherent sheaf on X, and how do we define it? So the first thing we do is look at ON, which is a, a coherent sheaf, in fact an invertible sheaf, on P1. Okay, uh, it's an invertible sheaf, so it corresponds to a line bundle, and we can pull that line bundle and invertible sheaf back up by this F onto X. Okay, so now we have something that's a line bundle on x and also an invertible sheaf there it's a coherent sheaf and we can take the tense product with this coherent sheaf and we get a new coherent sheaf here remember this is going to be uh, locally free of rank one so locally this m twisted by n will look like m okay that's something that you have but uh, globally it's going to be different okay in general at least okay sometimes it might be isomorphic but in general it's going to be actually non-isomorphic as well Okay, so that's something that you have, and that's called twisting by n. So remember this ON is an invertible sheaf. In fact, the inverse of ON is O minus n, and you can check easily that the, when you tensor the ON and O minus n together, you get O, so that's the identity in this um, uh, monoidal category. Okay, so you've got that um, situation. So really, tensoring by this invertible sheaf here is an invertible, uh, uh, gives you an equivalence of categories. Okay, so in particular, it's exact, it has lots of nice properties. So we can go backwards and forwards and recover the original M from this by just tensoring uh, with F upper star O minus N. Okay, so this does, uh, even though you may think well, you've changed this a bit, okay, we can recover the original by using that trick. Okay, so let's look at these two fundamental theorems of Serre, and I want to break it up in a couple of different ways. So the first one is the finiteness I want to talk about, and this is a very, very natural question to ask. Okay, so we're going to look at the dimensions of these cohomology uh, spaces, of cohomology groups. Okay, so here in the case of curves, we have H0 and H1. H0 is something we're interested in, this Riemann rock space, um, in the case when M is given by a an invertible sheaf, okay, so this is something that's very important. Maybe you're only interested in H0, okay, but as I said, if you're interested in H0, sometimes you're forced to study that cohomology as well. We want to look at the dimension of this, and the point is the dimension, often denoted by little hi, is always finite. Okay, so that's the finiteness theorem, and that's a rather nice theorem, okay. So uh, that means that at least when you want to set up the theory, okay, you can talk about this dimension and you know it's going to be some sort of number that you can try to work at, okay. Um, so that's uh, something that's very important to make the theory go through and it also means that it's a good thing to try to work out uh, what this is. You don't have to try to work out first that it's finite and then work out what the number is. Okay, so that's a thing. So the other thing uh, that's very important is vanishing. And what does vanishing say? So of course we would like the situation where h1 is equal to uh, uh, 0. 
So the point here is that, okay, let's have a look at H1. That's the non uh, the higher cohomology group, okay. H1, for large enough n, that's the thing that we're twisting by, so from some point onwards, some value of n and every single bigger one, H1 of m, n is equal to zero. Now, of course, we can't always guarantee that uh, H1 of m is equal to zero, but the point is that when you twist uh, using the Serre twist far enough out, okay, you will get zero. Okay, so this is something that when you first look at, you may think, well, how am I going to use that? And I'll try to give you some instances about how to use that uh, later on. But at least it means that you do have situations. I, I guess the key point that you want to uh, have here is that H1 equals zero. That's a desirable situation. Um, as I even heard Sayer once himself <laughs> state, okay, it's desirable to have all the co higher cohomology vanish. Okay, because then when you look at the long sequence, exact sequence that you have, okay, you have a short exact sequence in the um, global sections. Okay, so this is a uh, desirable uh, situation is to have vanishing uh, H1. And the point is that we just want lots of theorems to guarantee when that happens. And the point here is that it doesn't matter what M you have here, at least there's this related coherent sheaf for which this uh, cohomology vanishes. And so the next uh, part of this, which is really something that you use to prove the vanishing, uh, it's part of his theory, it's not really so much part of say vanishing, is the following. It's perhaps more often called uh, generation by global sections. Okay, So there exists a surjection of the form, um, if you twist far enough out, okay, this mn, you can have a surjection from some finite direct sum of copies of O to mn. Okay, so this is rather nice. It means that to a certain extent you can bound the size of this MN okay, as a global object okay, uh, in terms of O. Okay, it's just some finite direct sum of copies of O. So that's up for MN. And remember what I told you is that this twisting procedure, it's an equivalent of uh, categories. So we can undo the twisting and we can tensor by O minus N and that will bring you back this MN back to M and these O's will go to O minus N. Okay, so that's basically that's OX and you tensor it with it. So it's basically an upper star of O minus N. You have a finite number of copies of that will subject on to M. So given any coherent sheaf, okay, to a certain extent, uh, you can bound it by these O minus N's. Okay, there's some sort of upper bound in the sense that there is some subjection from a finite direct sum of copies of them onto this M. And we'll see how this is actually quite useful uh, in the theory Okay, and the key point here is that, uh, and what makes it nice in this case of curves, uh, so that I can actually try to give you a proof of this, okay, is that we can compute everything nicely on P1. So you can also set this up so that uh, you've got a simple situation on Pn. The notation gets a little bit more awkward, but there is an analogous theorem and it works there. Okay, so let me just show you a key computation on P1, which hopefully also will help you absorb what's going on here. Okay. So the first thing is the finiteness. So I guess the key interesting things going on here with P1, so it's quite easy to see with torsion sheaves. Uh, we've shown already that H1 is always equal to zero, and H0 is not difficult to see that the um, global sections there is also finite dimensional. So the more interesting ones are what you get from um, these uh, ONs here, okay? So these invertible sheaves ON, okay? What's the cohomology in this, uh, in this case, okay? So uh, the dimension of ON here is going to be, it should be some function of N, and the function is essentially N plus one, but this is a dimension of some uh, vector space, so it has to always be non-negative, so it's the maximum of zero at N plus one. And what about H1, okay? H1, that should be some nice function of N, and in this case, it's minus N minus one, except for when this is negative, so if, uh, n is, uh, um, yeah, so if n is um, uh, going to make this uh, negative, then it's zero, okay? So if n is even um, minus one, you'll get zero here, and um, for values like uh, uh, one, okay, you'll get negative numbers, okay, zero, one, so forth, you get negative numbers, okay, so it's, it's zero. So this is just a computation. We've got a definition, and it's actually quite nicely computable. So let me show you how that works. Um, so actually, we've computed in um, my playlist on uh, a user's guide to coherent sheaves, uh, what were the global sections of this ON on P1. 
And just to remind you of that answer, okay, if X and Y are your homogeneous coordinates on P1, then basically you have all the degree N forms in X and Y. So you basically have uh, linear combinations X to the N, X to the N minus 1 Y, all the way up to Y to the N. And of course, the number of these elements is equal to um, uh, N plus 1, uh, except when, of course, uh, N is uh, negative, okay? So when N is negative, then you don't have this answer, so you have to take zero there, okay? So this doesn't make sense for N. Uh, so this is for N greater than zero, okay? And it's going to be empty once N is negative. Okay, so the H1 is the more interesting one, so let's just see how that works. And again, what do we need to do here? Um, so what we do is we have to look at ON on the two affine patches on the patch A0, which is above A1Z. Uh, uh, okay, so here, uh, U0, we're on P1, so this is A1Z, that's K of Z. Okay, so basically it's just a structure sheaf, so on A1Z inverse, it's KZ inverse. And the key point is that these both, you can restrict them both to the intersection of A1Z and A1Z inverse, and the, uh, the ring there, uh, the ring of regular functions there is KZZ inverse, so that's what this, uh, invertible sheaf has to be, it's, like, uh, it's actually free there, okay, since it's free on both of these two. And the key thing is how does the N come in? Well that tells you how you glue, okay. So the KZ you can map straight into here, but with the uh, KZ inverse you should multiply this by minus Z to the N, okay, and that's where the depends on the N here uh, comes in. Okay, so let's just compute this co-kernel, okay. So you've got this, uh, basically it's just going to be this co-domain modular the image of this, so the codomain will stick up here, KZZ inverse, and the image of this, okay, the image of this is going to be spanned by, well, the image of this KZ, so that's basically this first row here, all these non-negative powers of Z are in there, so once you factor all of them, the only thing you'll have are negative powers of Z. So how can you get negative powers of Z? Well, you've multiplied this KZ inverse by Z to the minus N. So you'll certainly get some negative powers of n in there, uh, of z in there rather. And which negative powers do you have? So well, the the um, the the starting point will be one times z to the n. So there's k times z to the n. You've also got z inverse times z to the n in there. So that's z to the n minus one. And similarly, z to the n minus two, and all those ones going down. So you've got all the ones from uh, k, uh, z to the zero onwards and all the ones from Z to the N backwards, wherever that N is. So if they overlap, okay, you won't get anything, okay. Uh, so, but if they don't overlap, then you might have something in between. And let's work out what that something in between is, okay. The something in between should be, well, you, you start with this K to the Z minus one, okay. And you can go all the way down to, what does it include here? You have Z to the N in here, but you, in this bit here, you don't have Z to the N plus one. Uh, uh, KZ to the N plus 1. So let me just put that Z in there. KZ to the N plus 1. Write it properly. So you don't have that value. Right? Okay. Z to the N plus 1 here. Okay. And this is the case if N, well, you can make sense of this expression that its N is less than 1. If N is less than 1, so it's like minus 2 or more negative, okay, this will be minus one, so you'll have one thing there, and if it's more negative, you'll have more terms. And if you count how many terms there are in here, of course you've gone from minus one up to the negative of minus n minus one. So there's the minus n minus one that you have here. Okay, so this is a simple calculation, I won't uh, dwell on it anymore, um, but it's rather nice that now you can completely compute the cohomology of these invertible sheaves on P, P1. And in fact, since you have Groton Dick splitting theorem, uh, this will basically give you all the cohomology that you want on P1, uh, but we'll actually use this to prove the Groton Dick splitting theorem. Okay, great. So we've got the key computation on P1, and one of the things that does tell you, for example, is that Sayer's finiteness theorem is true in this case here. Okay, it's it's certainly true in this case uh, here. All these ONs, okay, they are finite dimensional. Okay. Um, so I guess this second part is trivially true, okay, O, uh, N, um, so I guess uh, uh, maybe that uh, requires a little bit more uh, work to see why that's true, um, but you always have a surjection uh, like this uh, when you twist out, um, 
uh, but you can show that too. And then the interesting thing is about the vanishing of cohomology. So basically, you've got a minus n here. So if you twist this, if you take one of these, and you twist this far enough, um, then you'll make this n positive, sufficiently positive, that this is going to be uh, the maximum of this. Since this is very positive, that's going to be negative, so the maximum will be the zero. Okay. So at least in the case of a sheaf like this, this say vanishing holds true. Okay. If you have O, it doesn't matter how negative this be, so that may mean that this H1 is non-zero, okay, you can twist it so it becomes positive, as positive as you like. But regardless, as long as uh, you twist it far enough so that n is greater than or minus 1, then this h1 is 0, and you have that say vanishing okay, for higher twists. OK, so let's go to the proof of this. Um, and it's essentially given from this key computation and just uh, natural things that you do with cohomology. Okay? So the main computation has been done. Okay, so let me just show you how that works. Um, and uh, oh, maybe there's one more point. So, so I guess uh, m m much of the computation has been done. There's a little bit that you need to do for part two. Okay? So what I want to do, step one is the following. Um, or maybe I'll make the f f first remark, okay? And that is that really, we can assume that x equals p1. So why is that? So we want to prove all these results in the case of x. And I'll say, actually, you can pretend you're on p1. So why is that? Well, all these results are essentially talking about things on um, uh, about cohomology. That's the most important thing. This part here is not um, of that form, but uh, you'll see that uh, it's it's n not a problem in this case anyway. And the thing is, how do you compute cohomology? Okay, to, to compute cohomology, uh, what do you need to do? Um, so what you need to do is you need to uh, look at what it is on u0 and u1, and then also what it is on the intersection of u0 and u1. Okay, and then you've got this uh, uh, descent data. And what you can do is you can take the, what it is on u0 and u1 and use those modules to form something on a1z and a1z inverse. And the descent data gives you something that's descent data on p1. So it's basically, if you start with the coherent sheaf on uh, this uh, x, you can get a coherent sheaf on p1. And once you have uh, this coherent sheaf on p1, okay, we're going to denote this by f lower star of n. Okay? You can construct a new coherent sheaf on p1 called f lower star on m, and that's essentially using the prescription that I gave you. Okay? Uh, the coherent sheaf on x is just uh, the sections on u0, okay, the sections on u1, okay, and the descent data, which says how when you what happens when you go to the intersection, okay, and how they match up, and you can use that con to construct basically those two modules give you something on a1z and a1z inverse, and also descent data on the intersection of that, okay, and that's your flow of star. And with that left lower star, now um, you can actually uh, construct, um, you can see that since then, when you try to compute cohomology, whether it's H0, H1, you're using just those, uh, th that piece of data, which is what it is on a, um, uh, U0, U1, and the intersection, and the map between, right? It doesn't matter whether you work with M on X, okay? or whether you work with this f lower star m back down on p1, okay? You're going to get the same kernel and co-kernel of the same map, okay, as your cohomology. So that's why these two cohomology groups are the same. So we're just going to pretend for this that we're working with x equals p1. Okay, and the key point is that this last uh, statement here, b part 2, okay, the existence of these surjections is going to actually give us both vanishing and finiteness. So let me just show you how that works, okay? So let's suppose we have this uh, surjection here. If there's a surjection, you can look at the kernel of this and construct an exact sequence of this form, a short exact sequence. 0 to k is the kernel of that surjective map here. And then you just look at the long exact sequence, okay? So what does the long exact sequence say here? So the long exact sequence, we won't write down the whole of it. There's a bit with the involving h zeros, and then you get the h1. So let's look at the last of the h1s, so the h1 of this, h1 of the uh, o to the direct sum mn times, maps to h1 of m 
n and this is going to uh, map to zero and since this maps to zero and this is exact that means that this is surjective okay so what do we know here so we're working on p1 so h1 of o okay that's the case n equals zero here okay n equals zero here okay, so this is minus one this is zero so h1 here is zero so this is equal to zero right so this is uh, when you compute the cohomology of this, I hope you can see quite uh, easily that this is just the direct sum of h1 of O mn times. Okay, so you can pull the direct sum out. So that's zero. And since this subjects onto that, that implies that this is equal to zero. And that gives you your um, uh, vanishing, say vanishing. Okay, so h1 is equal to zero as long as this n is large enough that you have this surjection. Okay, so this is for all n. Large enough, you'll have this surjection, and so for all those n's, h1 of m twisted by n is equal to zero. Great. So what about finiteness? Okay. So and now we'll see why vanishing is sort of uh, uh, also important here. Okay. So the way we're going to do uh, finiteness, and this is kind of kind of a key sort of thing that's going on here. Okay. So the the key point of finiteness is that. Uh, perhaps the most important thing you want to know is that h0 is going to be uh, finite dimensional. But it turns out that actually to prove that h0 is finite dimensional, okay, you have to prove first that h1 is finite dimensional. So in these arguments and this theory that's uh, set, uh, set up, you have to do this by downward induction. So you start by showing that um, the higher cohomology uh, is finite uh, dimensional first. And then eventually the last thing you prove is that H0 is, okay? So in the case of curves, there's only H0 and H1. So the first thing we'll do is you'll prove that H1 is finite dimensional and then show that H0 is finite dimensional. And we'll use essentially the same short exact sequence, but of course we can have, we can twist it by this O uh, minus N. Okay, so we take that one, we twist it back. So this K goes to K minus N. This O goes to O minus N and you get M N copies of that and this mn goes to m. So you have this uh, uh, short exact sequence here. And now we can just apply the long exact sequence for that to try to get a hold on um, the global sections of m and the uh, uh, first cohomology of m as well. Okay, so let's look at the long exact sequence. So we'll, we have the uh, h0 of these terms. We'll start from here. Okay, so this is H0 of O to the minus N, Mn copies of that. And then we have H0 of M. That's what, one of the things what we want to look at. And then there's the connected homomorphism, which maps onto the H1 of these three terms, H1 of K minus N, H1 of O minus N to the Mn copies of that. And finally, H1 of M. And the nice thing is that we have this uh, Grotendieck vanishing, which is uh, clear from the way I've set it up here, that this goes to zero after that. Okay, so let's have a look at this. And so we need to do um, uh, uh, various uh, bits of work here. So um, uh, let's just see what happens. So the first thing to do is to try to show that uh, for any coherent sheaf, okay, uh, H1 is going to be finite dimensional. Okay. So what do we know is finite dimensional? So we've calculated what happens for all these uh, invertible sheaves O n or O minus n, okay? And we know that in both cases, both the H0 and the H1 are finite dimensional. So these ones are finite dimensional. So this is finite dimensional, and this is finite dimensional here. Now what's nice is that in this case here, you have a subjection from this finite dimensional thing onto this. So that implies that this has to be finite dimensional. Okay, and so that shows you that for any coherent sheaf, okay, uh, this H1 is going to be finite dimensional. And now what you want to do is you want to have a look at this one, okay, that maybe this is the one, most important one in many ways uh, that you're going to use in the theory. Okay, you want to show this is finite dimensional. Okay, so there's a map from here which is finite dimensional, but that might not be subjective, unfortunately. Okay, but the image is also the kernel of what goes on here. So basically, uh, what you can do is you can say that uh, this is essentially going to be the dimension of the image of this. Uh, okay. And then the co-kernel is going to map inside here. So you have to add also the dimension of the co-kernel of this. And so we just have to bound the, the dimensionality of this. But 
k to the minus n is a coherent sheaf. And by induction, we've shown that the first cohomology is always finite dimensional, so that also implies that, or maybe this here really implies that this is finite dimensional. And since these two are finite dimensional, in this long exact sequence, there's a sandwich in between these two finite dimensional things, so this is finite dimensional. So they both imply that that's finite dimensional. And that finally gives us a say finiteness. So the only thing that remains to prove this um, a theorem here is to prove this part two, okay, and this is what's called uh, uh, generation by global sections. Okay, so when you twist far enough, okay, remember a map from O to M N is essentially a global section. You've got enough maps from O to M N, okay, such that if you take the direct sum of enough of these maps, okay, you get a subjection. So what I want to do to complete the proof is I want to give you a bit of feel of what this means to twist by N, and hence show that there is such a surjection and hence show that this is uh, generated by global sections. Okay, so let's complete the proof of say finiteness and vanishing by proving the remaining assertion, which is that given any coherent sheaf M on that projective curve X, if you twist it far enough out, look at this MN, for all N uh, large enough, then there exists a surjection from O direct sum MN, some, some finite direct sum of copies of the structure sheaf O onto that MN. Okay, so I want, don't want to go through this in complete uh, detail, but I want to give you a flavor of what's going on and give you a suggestion for why it's true. So this is essentially a proof, um, but the details I'll be a little bit more brief with. Okay, so as usual, uh, when we're going to study this uh, sheaf here, uh, M, let's start with M. Uh, we look at the two affine patches, okay? So uh, we let uh, the patch on UI be given by this uh, Roman MI. And then one way to think about what is this uh, coherent sheaf M is via the descent data. You look at it, what it is on U0, so that's M0. And then you restrict that to uh, the intersection of those affine open patches to give you M0, Z inverse. Okay, that's this KZZ inverse module that's on the basically on the intersection of those two patches. Uh, we might as well work on P1, um, so uh, that's what you have here. And then uh, you can also restrict uh, M1, which is on the patch A1Z inverse, to uh, the intersection. So you have to invert Z inverse, so you join Z, and that's the descent data that you have. And similarly for ON, okay, you have the structure sheaf on uh, both uh, the A1Z, which now uh, when you intersect is KZZ inverse, okay, so it's KZ and you invert the Z, and the structure sheaf on A1Z inverse is KZ inverse, and you invert the Z inverse to give you Z, and the descent data here is Z to the minus N. So to give you a feel for what this MN is, uh, you can just look at it in terms of the descent data, and it's quite easy what goes on here. So essentially what you do is you just take tensor product of everything that's involved, so you take the tensor product of this on the, um, uh, A1Z side, you do M0, tensor, this is just KZ, so it's just a free module of rank 1, so you just get M0 back, and then when you look at the intersection, you have M0Z inverse, okay, and similarly, if you look on the A1Z inverse patch, you get M1, uh, tensor, the free module of rank 1, so that's just M1 again, and then you have to look at the intersection, so you invert Z inverse to join Z. And you also have to tensor product these, these uh, descent data. So instead of just using theta from this M0Z inverse to M1Z, okay, you have to multiply that by Z to the minus N. Okay, so remember Z to the minus N is just in the ring KZZ inverse. doesn't matter whether N is positive or negative or whatever it is. Okay, um, uh, so you change this theta by this amount. So if you're wondering, okay, what does this say twist do? Well, basically, from the descent data point of view, it doesn't change it by much. It just uh, changes the descent data theta by the z to the minus n. But the domain and the codomain of the descent data is the same. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's what we would like. Okay. And then we want a subjection of this form. Okay. So what does it mean? Firstly, to be a subjection of this form. So firstly, we have to find a map from here to here. Okay, and to be surjection just means that when you restrict it to the patch A1Z, it's going to be a surjection, and if you restrict it to patch A1Z inverse, it's going to be a surjection. Okay, now certainly this is a map of um, coherent sheaves, so on those uh, two patches, there'll be maps of K KZ uh, modules and KZ inverse modules. Okay, so uh, so that's what surjection means. So um, without loss of ger generality, actually, the key point is to just check what happens on one of the patches because the other one will be symmetric. 
So let's focus on the patch, which is A1Z inverse. So we're looking at M1 here. Okay, and this is where the coherence comes in, M1 here. Uh, this is going to be some KZ inverse module, right? And since this is coherent, that means it's a finitely generated KZ inverse module. So you, it has a finite set of generators. So we just pick one of these, M, okay? And we just want to make sure that there's a map from O to uh, MN such that when we restrict it to that A1Z inverse patch, you're going to hit this M. And if you can do this, okay, if you can find it, uh, that, then you can do this for the finitely many numbers of these um, uh, generators, KZ inverse generators of this M1, okay, and that will give you the suggestion onto the A1Z inverse patch, and then you do something similar, okay, so you'll need a, a number of them, one, so you'll have at least uh, uh, one of these O's for every generator, KZ inverse generator of M1, and then for each KZ generator of M0, you'll need another O to suggest onto that, probably, okay, or, or perhaps, and then once you can subject onto both the M0 and the M1, then you'll have this subjection, okay? So basically the idea is that this M inside M1, you should think of this as being a, um, a, a section that's defined everywhere except for uh, possibly at the zero. And we want to try to lift it so that it covers the zero as well. So we need to, we've got it on the patch A1Z inverse, and what we want to do is we want to find something, at least when we have the N that's large enough, we want to have something which is on the M0, uh, uh, on the A1Z uh, patch, which matches up with the thing on the um, uh, intersection, okay? So basically we want to get a global section of MN such that we hit the relevant element of this M1. So remember the global sections is the kernel of this M0 to M1 plus this uh, thing that you concoct using the descent data, one and minus set to the n theta inverse will map you to, well, the way I've written it down, uh, I'm using the inverse map here. Uh, so uh, this m0 naturally maps into m0 z inverse. And then uh, to map the m1 uh, back into here, m0 z inverse, we'll use uh, uh, the inverse of this. So that's set to the n theta inverse. And you have the negative here because you want the kernel, which means that's where they agree. So you want something on m0 on the a1 z patch and the a1 z inverse patch, which agree when you look at this twisted thing. Okay, so that's what you, you want to do here. And um, so, so basically that's the idea. You've got something here, remember, uh, the way to think about it, the sheet condition, and where does this kernel come about? Basically, you want something in M1, which is something on the A1Z inverse, okay? And we want to be able to have something that's also a global section. So you've also got a section on the A1Z uh, patch, and they have to match, and that's the matching criteria, okay? So what is it on the M1? Um, so that's the M on the A1Z inverse. And so what does it need to be here, essentially? That's the question. What does it need to be on the other patch? Well, you, you work out what this condition is. So the condition is, well, on the intersection, okay? So basically, when you look at theta inverse of M, and you multiply that Z to the N negative, right? Okay, that's basically what you want, to, what will end up being here. This element is on the intersection here. So you want something that hits that element. So essentially, you want something that, so to speak, uh, inside the M0, okay? So you want this minus Z to the N theta inverse of M to be inside here. So the theta inverse of M is only, okay, you're moving back into here, M0, Z inverse. So you start with this M0, but you've inverted this Z. And the key point is that, well, this is just some element in there, so it'll be uh, basically a fraction with some power of Z on the bottom. And if you multiply that power of Z on the bottom with a sufficiently high power of Z, you can clear that denominator so that essentially it is inside M0, or more, more precisely, you can lift it to an element of M0. Okay, so that's the key point. Once you make this N big enough, okay, this element theta inverse of M, theta inverse of M, which lands inside here, okay, if you make this N big enough, this element theta inverse of M, by multiplying by some high enough power, any high enough power of Z, you can clear the denominator. Once you clear the denominator, it's in M0, or more precisely, it can be lifted to an element of M0, so we can find the, uh, a global section, so a section on the A1Z patch, which matches that on the A1Z inverse patch, and hence a global section. And that global section, okay, gives you a map from O to M, N, such that when we restrict to the A1Z inverse patch, you will hit this generator, okay? So you do this for each generator, KZ inverse generator of M1, and each KZ generator of M0, and there you'll find your subjection from O, a direct sum, copy of, uh, direct sum of copies of O, 
to uh, all these sufficiently high twists of n. And that completes the proof of uh, Sayre's uh, theorem. So just to sum up what we've done in this uh, video, okay, we've looked at uh, some very important uh, theorems in uh, Sayre's theory of the cohomology of coherent sheaves on projective uh, varieties in the special case of curves. Okay, so the most important one here is the finiteness theorem, okay, which says that the dimension of these cohomology spaces, both H0 and H1, are finite dimensional. And what's interesting is in the proof, and this is kind of says why cohomology is so important, is to do this, it's actually by downward induction, you show that H1 is finite dimensional first, and then H0 is uh, finite dimensional. And in proving this, okay, one of the things that uh, also comes up and that's important generally is that you want some good conditions for when H1 vanishes. Okay? And we've seen that for given any coherent sheaf, okay, if you twist this far enough out, um, then H1 will vanish. Okay? So of course you can't expect every coherent sheaf to have H1 equal to zero, but at least there's a related sheaf, okay, which is zero. And this type of twist is very important in algebraic geometry. Okay, uh, uh, partly for this reason, and the other reason why it's important is that you can always twist back to get the original coherent sheaf. So information about this will tell you information about the original coherent sheaf. And finally, uh, the thing that we proved is this wonderful sort of like form. Okay, this is also called uh, global generation. Okay, um, uh, for these twists, if you twist far enough out, it's going to always be generated by global sections. And this gives you a nice way to give you some sort of control, okay, an upper bound on this MN, which is global. Okay, so certainly this is kind of, um, if you look at this on an affine patch, right, it's certainly true that any finitely generated module, you have some sort of um, uh, surjection from a direct sum of copies of the ring onto that finitely generated module. And this is saying that you can do this, uh, you have an analog of this fact in the case for coherent sheaves on projective curves, okay? So you have this, uh, this ejection, but you have to twist this far enough out. If you don't want to do it from, uh, from that point of view, you want to control the M, of course you can twist this back. And that's another way also to say it, is that, uh, okay, so maybe you can't always get some uh, ejection onto any coherent sheaf of, of some direct sum of copies of the structure sheaf O, but you can always get some subjection from some direct sum of copies of O to the minus N, where this N is sufficiently large. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.